We're here right now with Elizabeth Gilbert, who everybody knows from Eat, Pray, Love and the follow-up, but now you've written a brand new book. The book is called The Signature of All Things. But first, why don't you talk about the fact that you're writing fiction? Well, um, I'm writing fiction again. That's the weird thing. I don't expect for people to know this about me, but it, it is my heritage. Like I, My first two books were works of fiction. My first book was a short story collection, and then there was a novel, and all I ever wanted to be my whole life was a writer of fiction. And I was on that path, and then my personal life, as everybody who has 10 bucks to buy a paperback knows, totally fell apart. And I used my writing for other things. Um, I used my writing to kind of write my way out of a hole that I was in in my life. And then I used my writing to figure out my feelings about marriage. And I used my writing for a bunch of other stuff. Um, but next thing I knew, 12 years had passed. And I hadn't written a word of fiction. And I felt like I had lost track of some really important fundamental part of myself, um, my own origin story in a way. So it was time. It was time to go back to writing a novel. And I just felt liberated. Like, do what you want. Like, write the book you would want to read. Um, go, go really off and uh, in, in some very unexpected direction and enjoy. And that's what I did. <laughs> well, that's the thing. When you, write, when you write a memoir, there is that boundary that you're not supposed to cross. Yeah. And here, you can run. What did that feel like, being able to go back to that again, just being able to run? I had forgotten the joy of fiction. I had forgotten the power of fiction. I had forgotten that if you decree it, it is so. If you can make it plausible. You know, my, my, my main character, Alma Whitaker, um, grows up in tremendous luxury because her father is a self-made millionaire. One of, I, I decided that he was one of America's first self-made millionaires. I decided he had made his fortune in the botanical trade, and I decided it was in the quinine trade, um, working on malaria, and he was an early pharmacist. And, and all I had to do was just make it convincing that he could have risen um, very quickly to such great wealth, and suddenly, because I decreed it, he's the wealthiest man in the new world. And I was like, oh my God, I forgot that you can just do that. You know, um, if you can get away with it, you can do it. You know, yeah. and you can't do that when you're writing biography or certainly not when you're writing autobiography. You know, you're bound by the truth and you're bound by your own introspection. So, and just to reach big, that's what I wanted to do with this book too. Like just do like write a big 19th century novel, a big galloping, sweeping epic. Write the kind of book that, that you love. I mean, by the time I started the book, I had six shoe boxes filled with index cards categorized by subject about everything that's in this book. Um, and, and I remember sort of opening them and all looking at them and I'm like, okay, I think I have everything I need here. I you know, I hope I know everything I need to know about shipping, about the pharmaceutical business, about, you know, uh, Philadelphia at the turn of the 19th century about um, women botanical illustrators, about uh, sex and marriage in the 19th century, um, about the schism between religion and science that happened in the middle of the, that century. I mean, there are so many pieces to put together, but um, all of that is the stuff I'm really excited by and want to know about anyway. Um, the problem I had was not knowing whether once that research was done, I could actually pull off the book. Until the very first page, I still wasn't sure that I could do it. <laughs> yeah, the words that one uses when you've written a book like a sweeping, saga, epic, you cross centuries. Yeah. You didn't just jump into fiction like and write this story. You wrote a big story. Yeah. So was that a conscious decision? I'm going big. Yeah. Go, go big or go home. It, it was. I mean, it's a book. It's the kind of book I've always wanted to write. And I was at a moment in my life where I realized that I could. Um, thanks to the success of Eat, Pray, Love and Committed, I was financially stable. Thanks to my happy marriage and getting my life in order, I was emotionally stable. Um, thanks to my good health, I was sort of physically and mentally stable. You know, I realized like, oh my God, I'm stable. Um, what, what, what then can you do with this? You have all this energy and you have all these enthusiasms and there's, you haven't like sabotaged your life in any big way recently, you know? Um, why don't you just take it on, you know? Um, I had the time to do things like go to the South Pacific and explore these remote islands in the um, French Polynesian archipelago in order to get that setting, because part of the book is it takes place there. I was able to go to Kew Gardens at London and work with the botanical librarians there on discovering 19th century botanical history. I was able to go to Amsterdam. You know, all the stuff that I wouldn't have been able to do as a young novelist because Frankly, it's expensive and it's time consuming and when you're working as a waitress, you can't do that stuff. You know, so it's sort of the book for me is also a celebration of um, this great moment of sort of abundance and contentment in my life. Like, um, what are you going to make out of that? And, and this is the book that I wanted to make out of it. Once you started to actually write, how long did it take to actually do the writing after all that research? It was pretty fast, I have to say. It was weird. Um, it was kind of a, 
as maybe, what do they say, like a fugue state? I mean, it was, um, and, and part of that was that I had a momentum that I was very afraid I was going to lose. I, had a, I felt like I was, had a tiger by the tail, and if I let go for one second to even brush my teeth, <laughs> I was going to lose it. And um, there's a line in the book about Alma, my character, where she's writing the great scientific treaties of her life, and it says that like a drunk who can run without falling but cannot walk without falling, she was propelled to do this work really quickly. And that's kind of how I felt when I was writing the book. I was like, I can, I have to do this full speed or else I'm gonna, I'm gonna lose it. I'm gonna lose my confidence. I'm gonna fall off. It's like a tight, tight rope that if you, if you slow down, you're just gonna topple off it. So, um, I don't know, four or five months. I mean, a, a, a very short amount of time um, and a very driven train. And the really cool thing too that I've never done before was with this book, Every night, I wrote all day, and then every night I would read to my husband what I had written that day. So it became like a serial novel the way Dickens wrote, yeah. because every day he was expecting the next installment. He was waiting. You know, and so I was aware of his waiting, and I wanted to entertain him and delight him. And so he would come up into my library in the attic where I work, and he would bring a glass of wine, and he would sit down, and he would say, what happened? What happened? What happened to Alma? What happened to Henry? What happened to Ambrose? What happened to these characters? And, and so I feel like that really helped the novel stay speedy to where I didn't want to I could tell if I was boring him um, I felt an obligation to tell him a great yarn um, and so I'm hoping that the readers will feel that the, the idea that um, I just want to bring them on a big trip that they're gonna enjoy and not get bored by <laughs> your personality is large you you're excitable you like to talk about your work and others and and you're fun and you like to laugh yet for so many writers it's a really solitary life yeah and so how do you, as a person who's, that's not you, I mean, how do you then bust out so that you're not that? And that I'm sure then talking about the book is a blast because you're finally out in the world. But how do you deal with it when you're in that writing moment? It's tricky. I sometimes wish I had more of a writer's temperament. Um, I think I would write more um, if I wasn't so interested in human beings <laughs> and life and the world and um, my other pursuits and things that excite me. Um, I think. Sometimes I have a little bit of envy for like the brooding, uh, you know, like I was just reading a, I was just reading an article in the New Yorker about that um, Italian writer Elena Ferrante, and yeah. you know who doesn't ever like nobody even knows who she is. She never goes on tour, and she has these great kind of very deeply serious, profound statements about writing. Like I'm not going to go promote my book because I wrote this book to free myself, not to be its slave, to go on tour. And I'm like, God, I see it so differently. You know, like I, I'm so excited. Like, I wrote this for people and I want to take it to them. You know, I want to like go to their local bookstore right. and be like, I wrote this for you guys. I can't imagine you any like other it. way. I mean, you know, there's so um, much energy bouncing out. Yeah, it's, 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 it's a fun moment. And for me too, it's exciting. Like this is the most excited I've been about going out and discussing a book in years um, because I'm not talking about myself. I mean, of course, when I, when I go to public events, there will be people who ask, did you marry that Brazilian guy? From the movie, and I'll have to discuss that, or what is it like to have Julia Roberts play? Or, you know, like those questions will be there forever, and I welcome them. But for me, the exciting thing is, I want you to meet this woman that I wrote about. Um, she's become so dear to me through the writing of this novel that I have ceased to believe that she never existed. And I feel like it's time her story was told, and I want to bring her out into the world and um, and and show her around. Um, so that's sort of an exciting moment. With Eat, Pray, Love, it was about your life and the people would review it and they'd write things, mostly positive things about Eat, Pray, Love. Now it's yeah. not your life and there's gonna be reviewers coming at it. Yeah. What's the difference in the way you perceive those um, reviews and things that are coming your way? Well, the reviews haven't really started yet. I just got one, the first one from Kirkus and it made me so happy because um, it's a lovely review and it's a generous and, and kind review and nowhere in that review does it mention who Elizabeth Gilbert is? It's like, here's this book that we want to talk about. They took the book completely on its own merits. There's no mention that I have ever written anything prior to this. There's no discussion of that at all. It's just a, a really thoughtful and respectful review of this book. And I was like, I want to write a letter to them thanking them for that, for just deciding to regard it as, as its own thing. Um, I don't expect that that will be the trend. Um, I think people will have to whatever, have their opinions about me and about my former work, but that made me happy. Um, it's a, it's a, it was a lovely gift. Like, just read it for what it is.